about programming in 6.40 p.m. That's some dedication. So we're going to be uh, talking about object-oriented game development in WordPress. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is when you look, there's a lot of information on how to go and structure plugins and objects in WordPress. There's a lot of information out there about how to go and use object-oriented development and maybe kind of put it on WordPress. But I haven't seen that many practical examples. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Who am I? I am a freelance web, uh, WordPress developer. I've been a web developer for two and a half years, self-taught. Laravel, a lot of hobbyists. I enjoy it. I don't use it as much as maybe I'd like, but there are a lot of people in the world who like WordPress sites, and I'm a JavaScript learner. Not necessarily as comfortable there, but um, today we're going to be talking about a little bit of the history of WordPress just in context of how we got here, how we're using this procedural code when so much modern coding has become object-oriented. We'll talk about the benefits of object-oriented programming. We'll talk about, you know, a little bit of a, an overview of kind of how these uh, concepts apply to WordPress. Not going to spend too much time on that. I want to talk about cleaning up the functions PHP file and then finally getting uh, some classes in our template files in a way that may be able to go and help you out and organize your code a little bit. So this talk is primarily going to be geared towards PHP developers who uh, already know some object-oriented programming but aren't really sure how to incorporate into their WordPress themes or just WordPress developers who want to learn some of these practices this isn't necessarily going to be an overview of object-oriented programming in general. There's a lot of great overviews out there. I'm going to have some recommendations for if you're new to this, how to learn object-oriented programming, so you may be able to apply some of these uh, near the end of the talk. So, history of WordPress. Rasmus Lentborg invented uh, PHP back in 1994, so he could go and track visits to his online resume. As crazy as that is, this is a technology that now powers about 80% of the internet. Now, back in 2001, uh, Michael Van Trigge, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, built an open source blogging platform called B2 Cafe. My screen went blank. I'll just keep talking. And here we go. Wait, wait for it. There we go. So this guy went and built a, a blogging platform called B2 Cafe back in 2001. This was still really early days for PHP. And uh, he ended up just abandoning it in uh, 2003. A guy named Matt Molenweg and another guy named Matt Little picked up this abandoned work uh, project, rebranded his WordPress, had an official uh, 1.0 release. And now it uh, powers, you know, 80% of the internet. Now, the thing is, back when it was released, there was limited support for object-oriented programming. So WordPress, B2 Cafe is written mostly with procedural code. Now, 15 years later, WordPress powers 34% uh, of the internet and is starting to embrace modern technologies like React.js and just recently went and bumped up their minimum PHP version from 5.2 which is over a decade old, to uh, 5.6. So we're going to be able to start using some of this. Now, just really quickly, I'm going to talk about some of the benefits of object-oriented programming. So you can stop pre or prefixing your function names. So just out of a, a show of hands, how many people are doing uh, custom theme development right now? OK, so maybe third half. How many people are tired of going and putting in like the, the name of the theme, like mega theme, then my custom, uh, you know, excerpt length? Anyone tired of that? I know I am. Thank you. A few hands in the front. Going and starting to code in an object-oriented way can totally solve that problem for you. Another thing is you can go and encapsulate your data. So you don't have to be worried about having data in this global namespace where you may accidentally go in overwriting. You have further code organization out of the box. For those who are theme developers, how many of you have opened a custom theme and seen a functions file that was over a thousand lines long? Yeah, that's, we've all been there. 
I think one of the most exciting things about uh, using object-oriented WordPress is code reusability. There is so much code that, especially in the first year that I was doing WordPress development, I was going and copying over the same 100, 200 lines of boilerplate in my functions PHP file that I never looked at, never touched, and just cluttered things up and made it confusing when I was looking for stuff. And finally, removing boilerplate code. So WordPress object-oriented programming, and this is just a note for uh, some of the people in here who have experiences with other languages and have done a lot of object-oriented programming. So you've got a few things up here. We've got a walnut, we've got a spoon, we've got a foam. Now, all of these are being used for things that, that maybe not necessarily are the primary uses. We're using a walnut to go and cover up a, a piece of wood that has some uh, dents in it. Using a spoon to keep uh, water from boiling over. And if you put your phone in a cup, it gets a lot louder, which is cool if you're playing music and just don't have enough oomph to annoy your neighbors. So just like uh, these objects that aren't necessarily being used in the most common fashion, it doesn't mean that they're not useful. For anyone who's familiar with like the Game of Four uh, design patterns book, this isn't going to fall with that. There's, I think that it's still useful to be able to take advantage of some object-oriented programming uh, principles without necessarily going and doing things the way that we decided may have been best for Java in you know the 1990s. So let's talk about functions PHP. We had talked earlier, you know, this can be a file that gets thousands and thousands of lines long. Now, what is PHP, functions.php do? We're going and adding support for features like the post thumbnail and custom image sizes, nav menus. We're going and doing that within the after setup theme hook. We've got widgets that are hooked within the, the widgets init hook. Registering nav menus, which I don't remember off the top of my head where you go and put those. You go in on queue your CSS and JavaScript within the WP on queue scripts uh, hook. And I don't always remember if it's scripts or styles. And I also don't always remember which one is add, which one is, is going to be a register, which one is on queue. Frankly, I can't remember all of this when it comes to book, hooks, function names, et cetera, in, in PHP. Which one am I looking for? Is it after setup theme or after theme setup? Let's see what we can do. We can simplify this with object-oriented theme development by creating a theme object. Now, when you think about it, you're going, and as you register nav menus, as you add an image size, as you build an on queue script, you're kind of going and performing an action on the theme itself. So what if we had a theme object and give it a simple object-oriented API? So we've got all these that I was talking about. We're adding theme support. We're adding an image size. We're registering an app menu. Now, in my mind, I'm not going to remember those. And also in my mind, I think those all kind of do the same thing. You're going and adding something to a theme. So what if instead of all of this in a bunch of different hooks, we just created our theme object and had an add support method to add theme support, an add image size to add image sizes, add nav menus, add sidebar, add script, and add style. This is a lot easier to remember. And by going and taking advantage of some of the things that object-oriented programming lets us do, we can have these go and hook into WordPress automatically so we don't have to remember the hooks, the names of the hooks, or the API. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And I'm sorry this is a little small for the people in the back. Can you see it at all? Yeah. Cool. This is what most of my functions files on the themes that I've made within the last eight months look like. I my theme class, require it, you know, first, second line. I knew what the theme. I initialize it. Then go into add nav menus, top navigation, top navigation, 
add theme support, post thumbnails. I'm imagining most of the, the theme developers in here use post thumbnails. That's something that you're going to see in almost all functions files. Add an image size. I always like to have one that's about 1,600 pixels wide, something that I can use for a big hero image and not necessarily just use the full size one in case the uh, user might have uploaded something 8,000 pixels wide. And then I can go and add a, a style sheet and script. Now all of these, I'm going and creating this theme object, and all of these are just actions that are being uh, <clears throat> performed on this object. And you don't need any hooks whatsoever, because all that's going to be done in the background. And this can make you a lot more productive. So let's see how we might be able to actually go about doing that. So here's my theme class that I went and pulled in in the first uh, three lines of the code. This is just one uh, method on it. We've got public, which just means it can be uh, uh, accessed from the outside. Function add and app menus. So we're going and passing the locations in. And here's where it gets cool. In the line after that, we go add action, after setup theme, use a, a anonymous function. I'm sure that a lot of you, jQuery, uh, a lot of experience with those in JavaScript. And then this locations array that, that we've got, we're just going and passing that in as an argument using the use keyword in PHP. I'm pretty sure that by uh, PHP 5.6, which is now the minimum WordPress requirement, you can use all of these features. Register an app menu, pull it right there so you've already hooked it, and then locations. So now with just a couple of lines of code that you can reuse on anything, you can just copy and paste this file in, you can go and have theme, little arrow, add an app menus, and that'll just always work with way less code and way less surface area for error, because you don't have to remember when you're doing it. Is it after theme setup or after setup theme? I've messed that up more times than I can count. Now, the one thing is, if you do mess it up, it's going to fail silently. You're just going to be looking at your theme and going, why is that not going and adding that app menu? So one thing that I like to do when we're doing this is I like to go and actually create an after theme setup uh, method on my theme class. And then when I go and do uh, add and add menus, I go and pass it into this function that has an action in here. That way, I can only get it wrong in one place. And if I get the method name wrong when I'm calling it, WordPress just chokes the eyes and throws a total fit with error messages. Which is what I prefer to see, because if I made a mistake, I want to know what I did wrong and have WordPress tell me about it. So, one of the other cool things that's happening here is we're also, as we're going and calling this add nav menus uh, method, we're going and returning the uh, instance of the object itself with this method. So, how many people in here use jQuery? Just out of curiosity. Quite a few. So you know how you can do all that method chaining, jQuery, uh, children, then keep passing it in? If you go and return this after every method, you can start chaining these things. So now, let's take some of the code that we don't care about. I was telling you a little earlier that I used probably 200 lines of stuff that was just boilerplate back when we started making WordPress themes uh, two years ago. So let's go and see what we can hide. Maybe going and adding the title tab or a custom logo, uh, post thumbnails, customized refresh widgets, HTML5. I can add theme support for these on every single site that I do. So one thing that we could do here is let's go and create an add support method. Now, add support's a little weird when you look in the WordPress source code. It goes and counts the number of um, arguments that was passed to it. So I'm conditional just going and checking, do I have anything in that second place 
If not, don't pass that down to WordPress. I go and return it. And then suddenly I can go and just using this on my theme init method, go and hide all this stuff that's going to be the same on every site that I never want to worry about again. Because if it's in a file that I'm using, the only thing that I can do to it is accidentally remove it or break it. So in this init method on the theme class, we're going in and adding the title tag, post thumbnails, customized selected refresh widgets, automatic RSS feed links, HTML5, search form, comment form, comment list, comment, uh, or gallery and caption. Most themes that you're building for your clients are going to have some or all of these. And what's more is you can also go and create a remove support method on this class and remove that menus. And for every action, you can go and start to do that as well. So that leaves us again with a really, really clean functions.php file where we're doing what may go and normally cost us uh, 200 lines of code. And you're just seeing exactly what is unique to that theme and shoving the rest in a drawer that you never want to see. So, any questions so far? I'll have questions at the end too if you want to wait, but I figured I'd ask before we move on to kind of the next topic here. I have a question. Yeah. Does it speed up the WordPress site by doing this or solve Nope. There won't be any noticeable difference in speed or performance. Um, there might be a slight difference, but nothing noticeable, especially unless you're getting like a million requests at a time. Anything else? Oh. Yeah. So this is way above my level in WordPress right now. Yeah. Which one that you're talking about, but I know what coding is and yeah. all that stuff. Um, because I've does something having cut and paste. Yeah. Um, so objects, so if you're an object, define what the object is like. Cool, let's back up a little bit. Okay. So what an object is, is in coding you've got some variables, right? You can have a string of characters, some words. You can have a number, an integer, it doesn't have a decimal point. You can have numbers with decimal points. You can also go and have an array of information that goes and contains maybe just integers, maybe integers and some strings of words. You can go and create some pretty cool stuff with data, but it's pretty simple data. So when we're talking about an object, we're going and saying like, let's create something a little more complicated. Let's, since we're in web development, we could have a post object, right? So a post would go and uh, have some basic information. It would have a title, it would have an author, a, some content, a slug that you could go and find it by the URL, maybe some tags and stuff as well. So you're going to be taking a concept that may be a little more tangible or a little abstract and going and creating uh, an object that would go and represent this. Now you also have a class, which is what we were talking about a little earlier, that's just a prototype for, for what that would be. So like a, a class for a page would go and like, okay, we've got this property for content, property for title, property and author. The object itself would be the post hello world. Author Tyler Smith, and uh, the content would be hello world. It's great to see all of you. Thank you for coming tonight. So that's kind of what it is. It's just a more complicated uh, data store, and you can go and perform some actions on it, but it has some attributes that are unique to itself. Does that answer your question? Somewhat, but if I'm not into like filling themes, I guess I'm not going to worry too much about it. Not too much, no. I still want to. Yeah. Talk to me after if you have more questions. <laughs> so now I want to talk about going and using some of these classes in your templates, you know? How can we really make that work? So one of the, the things that actually got me into object-oriented theme development was working with Laravel, which is a framework for building websites that gives you a lot more options and more presses. Harder to use and less out of the box, so I don't use it that often. 
So here's what a typical WordPress page template looks like, right? We're grabbing the header, got a little HTML, running this loop, wall have post, the post, and then grabbing the title, content, any while statement, getting the footer. And this isn't too bad. We do have to uh, go and repeat some of this boilerplate on every post, though. The head, grabbing the header, maybe your container. You could go and put some of these containing elements in the header, but maybe you don't want to do some of that. So I really got interested in, in Laravel because their template looks like this. It's really elegant. You're going and extending layout, which is kind of a wrapper around your header, footer, maybe has some additional markup in it. And then you have a, a post um, container. So we're going to import each post as post instead of while have post the post. And just go and iterate through it. And then you're able to go and perform actions or just grab data right off of the actual post object itself. So I've got post title, post content. And that's going and displaying out what the title of the post is and what the, the content is as well. Now, one cool thing that I actually didn't know before I started uh, getting ready for this talk is you can actually do some of these th same things in WordPress. So, same thing that we were looking at earlier, except instead of using the title function and the content function, you can actually go and access the property directly. You can echo, get post, post title, echo, get post, uh, post content, which is really, really cool if you want to grab that and manipulate it in some way. Now, the problem is that if you've got any filters on that, so WordPress does some processing, especially with the post content, it's going to grab all of your short codes and transform them somehow. So if you just do this directly, you're not going to get any of those uh, transformations that WordPress would do. So you're going to need to wrap that somehow. Also something cool for those of us who use uh, advanced custom fields plugin, you can also just grab any piece of post layout off the post object with just a little arrow guy and using the name of the meta field that you have and it'll just grab it. Also like the post content, if advanced custom fields is doing anything to that data before you get it, you're not going to be able to get that. So what we would be able to do if we wanted to start using this in a more object-oriented way and be able to do some of those cool Laravel things where we're going to be grabbing uh, posts, going and doing some processing on the title, maybe doing some processing on the content, is we can go and create our own custom post class. So we've got this class, we've got a post that we're storing in it, which is that post uh, property in the constructor, which anytime you go and make a class, you've got a constructor. When you initialize it, if you pass something in, that'll go and set the variable or the class properties for the instance. So we can pass it post, and then we can go and just create a function for title or method rather, and a method for content. So you can go, pass that in, apply the filters that WordPress is using and that maybe any of your plugins are using, and then go ahead and return what that would look like. Just, you might want to come up with a better name than just class post, because there's a high probability that you're going to run into some kind of conflict there. So I figured I'd mention that. But all of a sudden, just look at the part that's uh, got the little box around it. We've got our WordPress loop going. Then each time through the loop, we're going and newing up uh, one of these post objects. And then we're uh, going and passing that in. So, totally forgot to assign that to a variable. Okay, we're going to pretend that didn't happen. So, now, one of the, the weaknesses of this is we don't have any way to go and assign um, one of our custom uh, post classes to the loop automatically, right? Pretend that, that this has current post, uh, is new post, get post, 
totally messed that up only seeing it now. But if we uh, do this, we have to go and new up our post every time. So one of the things that we can use, and this is where we start to get into some weird stuff that maybe, maybe you don't want to play around with because it's a little more advanced than the PHP topic, but you have something called interfaces when you use classes. So you can go and grab an interface like the iterator. And all that it does is create a contract that says, if you have this current method, this key method, this next method, rewind method, and valid method, you can go and iterate over an object the same way that you would iterate over an array uh, using a for each. So this is really cool. Now WordPress already gives us something out of the box with this. They have, if have posts, the posts, right? Or while have posts. So we can go and wire something up that does exactly that and goes and performs op uh, these operations on the actual WordPress query and then go and iterate through this and return whatever we want. Now, this is actually some pretty ugly code, so pretend that I explained all of this without getting too far into the weeds. This 80 lines of code is going and grabbing either a query that you pass into it or the global query, and it's manually triggering the have post, the post, and looping through it. Because it works in a different order than PHP's uh, iterator interface does, you can go and you just have to go and do a little bit of extra work to make sure that all of this uh, ends up working in a predictable way. But what you end up with is in your template, you can go and create a new query that has this iterator. And since that iterator returns whatever we want, we can new up our custom post class, loop through it with a for each, and then that's automatically going to be returning this, so we can put whatever methods we want on it. This becomes really useful. I'd say probably half the sites I ever built have a meet our team page, right? So you can have this, and you can go in advanced custom fields, say like, this is the person's title, this is the person's resume, this is the person's LinkedIn and Twitter information. Within your custom post class that we've created earlier, that this custom uh, query object using the iterator interface is using, we return that in all of those methods to grab that with advanced custom fields, get the old uh, function can happen behind the scenes. And we have really, really crystal clear looking templates with almost all of the actual logic that makes those things spit out encapsulated somewhere that we never look at, never have to see. So that's one of the biggest advantages. Um, if I've gone through and done uh, object-oriented WordPress uh, theme development, I found that really going and cleaning up functions PHP and going and trying to clean up my post templates like this. I mean, you can have taxonomies too, you can have menus, all of those are things that you can grab from the query, but this has been by far and away one of the things that has helped me clean up the actual code that I'm looking at day to day that, that my clients care about. So you can also go and automatically inject this query object into the templates. I wouldn't do it, because all the ways to do that end up looking pretty hacky. Um, I think probably the best solution to something like this would be using a templating engine that's already out there, like Laravel's Blade. Now, there are a few people who have already given a pretty good shot in incorporating uh, object-oriented WordPress development into starter themes. One of them is Sage9 by the Roots team, which is a really, really good starter. And they had gone and actually incorporated Blade into WordPress. It's complicated, but you can go and strip some of that code out, go and install it into WordPress, and actually write code, 
where you're using object-oriented programming, using bleed templating, and have super clean code that looks like this. Um, what's really cool is everything that we're talking about is free. Um, all that's open source, so you can see how it works, yeah. Hey, I was wondering, uh, where it says the code content, what do the exclamation points mean? That means that you're using unescaped, or, yeah, unescaped content. Oh, okay. Yeah, because otherwise some of the stuff that gets inserted into the post is just not going to render correctly. Yeah. I, uh, I actually had to go digging for how to do that when I first started playing around with it, so I'm like, is none of my stuff rendered correctly? Um, so that's most of what we're going to be talking about. Um, these are just a couple of practical examples I've, I've uh, used myself. Because too frequently, as I've looked for how to incorporate uh, object-oriented WordPress programming into theme development, I've only been able to find kind of how this stuff is being used in plugins. And uh, that hasn't been super useful for me. So I hope you got something out of this. I'm going to leave you with uh, some miscellaneous opinions. Um, this stuff is best for kind of one-off theme development for uh, clients who have maybe a design already. If you're trying to put something on like the free WordPress theme uh, repository, just don't use any of this. It doesn't exactly pass uh, coding standards. Also, use P or, uh, WordPress's PHP coding standards. One of the things that I run into while I'm going and trying to incorporate uh, P this kind of object-oriented stuff into WordPress and seeing how other people have done it, is you have people using PSR 1 and 2 coding standards, which is what Laravel uses, and it's this weird mix between like camel case and studly case opposed to the underscore separated variable method names that WordPress uses. So I prefer to just stick to one styling per, uh, per thing like that. Avoid studly case and camel space and only use PHP spaces if you're importing something from Composer. Even though we're using object-oriented uh, theme development, it's still WordPress in the end. So if you want more resources on this, I would definitely check out uh, Kevin Bodness's WordCamp video. Um, really, really great. He's where I got a lot of these ideas from. Uh, Carl Alexander actually just put out kind of a beginner book for uh, object-oriented development, and then ties it in with uh, WordPress at the end. Tom McFarland has been writing about this for years. And uh, if you're interested at all in Laravel, because that's where I learned uh, how to do a lot of this stuff, Laracast is a great resource. Um, other than that, thank you. You can follow me. Uh, there we go. Thank you. You can follow me at Tyler L. W. Smith on Twitter. Um, that's what I've got for you today. Are there any questions? Yeah. Um, why should we only use namespaces if uh, we're using them? Uh, mostly to avoid like use statements. I think so, only because it gets really confusing when you're in someone else's code base, and all of a sudden you have these mix of styles where you've got. WP query, which is you have to put a little slash in front of it. Um, I only use them when I'm auto loading. That's kind of a soft recommendation. Um, there's no rule against it. Most of WordPress doesn't use um, the uh, object oriented programming either, anyway, except under the hood. So I try and use it sparingly. Yeah. Do you ever get pushback from clients that it's a little too complicated and hard to find something to maintain? Uh, I haven't so much, because I've got probably four clients where I'm their primary developer. So most of, um, most of what I'm doing, they're not worrying about. And the cool thing is, like, let's go back a few slides. So like, with either of these implementations, this one or even this one where you're using Blade, you can always go and use an escape patch and still use the content function or still use the get field function. This is just another layer that you're sprinkling on top of it. But especially when you're doing this and so much of the WordPress API is um, just based in these functions, usually I, I use the escape patch pretty frequently myself. 
Um, I haven't had any pushback. Usually the other developers that end up working on my code base are kind of like, hey, what's that? It's a really clean functions file. Um, so I personally have it, but I could see that being an issue at some point. Anyone else? In the back. Where did you start uh, to learn WordPress? Lynda.com. Um, you can actually, if you're in Sacramento, a library membership will get you a free Lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning, I think. Definitely Linda membership, which is like $35 a month. Um, Morton Rain Hendrickson had a WordPress theme development course on there. I took that and started developing with WordPress immediately. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but I just quit a job uh, working in digital marketing. And our web developer, who is a freelancer like I am now, looked happier than I was. <laughs> He would, he would roll into the office once a week, short sandals, totally relaxed, usually just got back from the beach, and I'm like, I gotta get out of this. So I, I got a book, a for Dummies book, that was like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, like a thousand pages long. Read that over the course of two weeks, took the Lynda.com class on theme development and advanced custom fields and hit the ground running. It took me three months uh, from not knowing really anything to being able to build my first site. Other questions? Yeah. What was your first site? Uh, my first site was actually, so I got lucky. Um, I knew a guy who knew a guy who was managing a campaign for uh, Stanley of Marvel. And he had a campaign back in 2016, 2017 called Hands of Respect. Their website was WordPress, but the developer who put it together hadn't really been a web developer since 2009. He'd moved on to a print shop, so they needed something a little bit fancier. And I got on the phone with this the guy who ran this campaign and convinced him that I'd be able to build him another website, not knowing at all if that was true or not. <laughs> so uh, my first website was handsofrespect.com. It's still up there. That organization has had some weird things going on with it, but that was the first one I built, and then a lot of ones better after that that I've had the fortune of not designing. What was that? Hand of respect? Hands of respect. Hand of respect? Hands of respect. Oh. Hand of respect. Respect. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Other questions? Check it out on my phone. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, I was curious uh, how you use Maribel with the WordPress development, because I'm like a little familiar with yeah. Maribel. I just want, how, how do those work together? Is that something you need to add? Yeah. Does WordPress run? Does it already have it built in? No. So I'm using a package. Uh, that just gives you blade rendering from uh, the Composer repository. And I went and stripped a bunch of code out of Sage theme. And the guys who made that are way smarter than me and had already figured out most of the challenges of hooking that up to WordPress and just went and put it in a starter theme that I have. Okay. So I could actually share that code with you, uh, send you just on GitHub or something. Okay. Yeah. It takes a little bit of configuring, but once it's there, it's there. And you still have the option of using your PHP templates on anything, too. But I think it's going to look at the there is a separate project. Oh, yeah. Laravel is a totally separate project. You for Stanley? Uh, I did one website for him. Yeah. That's what it says Stanley. Yeah. yeah, Stanley of Marvel Comics. That's right. Other questions? Yeah. So what's your, your current like dev stack for this? Is it just WordPress bootstrap and you're connecting like the blade with ECF and everything else? Yeah, yeah. So blade, I just have it. I'm uh, using a package that lets me use it with WordPress. Mm -hmm. I've got a few hundred lines of code that I uh, went and ripped out of another theme that just makes everything a lot easier. It gets it all off the ground. And then I'm going and passing this uh, custom query object into it so that I have access to it. But I definitely wasn't smart enough to figure out the implementation myself. I pulled it out of Sage 9. 
by roots. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So are, are you still using that theme, or are you using like your own bootstrap sort of theme? I'm using my own uh, underscores based theme. Okay. Um, underscores is the theme that's maintained by Automatic, which yeah. is the company that yeah. maintains it. Yeah. So I just went and put some of that code in there, gotcha. and then went and put my own like little class implementation or uh, theme class implementation that I showed you earlier. And I'm able to code pretty efficiently with it. Some of it's a little bit newer. I only started doing the blade stuff recently. Yeah. And then are, are you just starting that on GitHub and just playing that one, or are you starting on the I usually just copy and paste. I think once I get it, um, like some of these uh, classes knocked away for like taxonomies and yeah. menus and the other things that uh, WordPress can go and query with the query object, I'll probably open source it. Um, I just haven't gotten around to that because I, my, my priority is going and just getting my client stuff yeah. done. Yeah. In the back. Um, I forgot I was going to ask you. Give me a sec. Cool. Yeah. So what other types of uh, accessory tools or support stack are you using, like managing DB, anything like that? Say that one more time. Like what other support tools or stack are you using outside of Minnesota inside itself to support it? So or your development processes. So like if you're familiar with like managed MVP. Yeah, yeah. So for I host mostly on Flywheel, just acquired um, by WP Engine, like everything else related to WordPress. <laughs> yeah. uh, WP Engine does a good job. I have never seen sites load faster than their stuff. Flywheel's had really good support, so I'm excited to see what they're able to do together. Um, that's my normal hosting. Uh, I, I typically use MAMP uh, for my local development environment. I tried local by uh, Flywheel. I just have never been smart enough to figure out how to connect that with Git to make sure all their reliability works. Um, and then just as far as other tools that I use, um, I use Laravel Mix for all my front-end processing, like my JavaScript and my SAS files, because it's just a lot easier than hooking up Webpack or Gulf or anything like that. Yeah. Are you doing all your own design also? Almost never. Um, I do white label development for a few agencies and then a few uh, mid-sized companies. And typically, they provide me a, uh, a designer. I've got a lot of skills I can fake design, but I am not a designer, and I have no aspiration to be. How did just on that topic? How did you, uh, when you were first finding clients and getting started, how did you, how did you avoid having to do design? Because that was my problem that I could never overcome. Luck. <laughs> I really wish that, that I had a better answer than that, but I would always just tell people up front, I don't do design. If you have a design resource, um, I can work with you there, or I could find one myself. Uh, but that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Every time they didn't have a designer, they would just go with another web developer. So that ended up working out OK. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna add to that, like, you know, as, as a freelance developer too, like a good way to get the work um, would be just to go to the agencies themselves and just say, hey, I'm a developer. Most of them have good designers to work with. Yeah. Comes and Absolutely. Yeah, those agencies, they they have what they like to call their bench of uh, their four developers that they contract out to their four designers. Because with freelancers, sometimes we're just stuck on a project and they need some help. So even, even some of the companies that have developers, don't be afraid to approach them. Um, a lot of times they're still looking. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I can say as, as a owner of an agency, that is basically the ideal scenario is go look for a century of competition, and uh, especially ones who are most successful, since they will have potentially too much work, and uh, that's potentially a good it's like you had your hand up, sir. Yeah, so, um, so I'm new most to WordPress and Laravel. Well, but how, uh, how much Laravel can you use in WordPress? How, how adaptable is it? Uh, I think the concepts are more helpful than Laravel itself. 
Um, usually, if you're developing in Laravel, you're developing in Laravel. If you're developing in WordPress, you're developing in WordPress. Laravel has some packages. Packages are different than plugins. Plugins, WordPress has its own plugin repository. Packages are usually managed by a PHP package manager called Composer, where you can go and download little pieces of Laravel or little uh, and put them in a WordPress theme or plugin. If you're new to both Laravel and WordPress, I would recommend spending serious time getting good at one or both in isolation before necessarily trying to mix the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else? Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Okay, so I, I have a question. A lot of times uh, people might say, well, why do you need a web developer? You can buy one of those themes that drag and drop yeah. and put together. What, what's your take on that? So I would think that may be a little less popular of a web developer, which I think that services like Wix and Squarespace have an enormous amount of value especially if you have a non-technical client. They don't just break. Um, the, the hosting's gonna work. The chances of it getting hacked are very, very small. Not, you don't necessarily need custom development. I think where our expertise as web developers actually comes more handy is being able to understand user flow and user interface. As I've seen clients go and put their websites together, Sometimes there are things that you would expect in an app menu that are in the body of the page and only on the home page. Like, I can't find the contact button anywhere. The images don't have alt tags, and none of the SEO stuff is filled out for meta descriptions. I think being able to go and work with clients who maybe don't want to pay our fees <laughs> could be helpful because we're bringing a lot more web experience to them and even though that's not necessarily our uh, development experience, it doesn't mean that it's not valuable and those services can offer great things. WordPress, usually where I start to recommend that is custom content types, where if you do have an employee page and you need, like, okay, I need their name, I need their LinkedIn, I need their Twitter, and I want it to go and link to every article they've ever written. Things like Squarespace, things like Wake Speedly, none of them are good. So I think that that's where we can add more value. Now, if you want to upsell them and you really believe that you can do a better job than Squarespace, you're probably right. Go for it. Um, I care a lot more about functionality and making the data do cool stuff than aesthetics. So that's usually where I try and spend my time. Awesome. I think I've got everyone. Anyone else? Last chance? Yes, so I, I just bought this Divi uh, uh, designer package. Divi's really cool. And so I'm wondering um, how, in your experience, how much of an impact does that make in terms of the, the design and the programming? Um, you wouldn't be doing necessarily as much CSS work yourself because Divi is very full featured. You can do a lot out of the box. And you can actually drag and drop a full site together without any programming that works pretty well. Mm. Um, when you're going, I have a lot of clients that are agencies though, and they're like, I want this to be two pixels over here, slightly overlap this. And those are the things where Divi starts to, you need to do a little bit more on top of Divi to get it to work. And usually people are hiring you for that or some kind of custom data thing. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it.